what do you do with information that you've got that the patient's got two condyles? How does that help you treat the patient? It doesn't because it doesn't tell you anything about the muscles. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going inside within the joint capsule. So, you know, I think it's a very limited value. And that's really been shown now in many papers. Are you treating your patient on or off the disc? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Now, if you're an orthodontist and you're moving 24, 28 teeth around simultaneously and it's your child, would you prefer to do that on healthy joints where you know everything's in the right place or it doesn't matter? That's something we need to decide as a profession, don't we? That's absolutely right. It doesn't make sense to me. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Patrick Grossman. He's now retired, but he treated TMD for 30 years. He was an orthodontist, and the way he treated it was an orthopedic approach. Now, I've learned from Patrick, but I've also learned from lots of other great clinicians. And some of the things that were said on the podcast by Patrick, I disagreed with. So you'll see me interjecting now and again. But I disagree with respect because I feel as though... TMD, especially with the lack of clear guidelines and evidence available, I mean, long-term high-quality data. I mean, if you look at all the systematic reviews, they all say we need better quality data. I think there's totally a place for all the things that Patrick says in the episode and his treatment philosophy. It's nice to understand it, but I also offer some alternative opinions. So it's up to you as a clinician to make up your mind in terms of which camp you want to follow and what aligns best with your values, your patients' values, and your clinical experience. Hello, Patricia Rati. I'm Jazz Glati. And if you're watching this episode, that means that Patrick Grossman kindly approved it for publish. I felt like I had to interject at certain points to, to give my viewpoint. And whilst I hope that served the listener, I do understand that this was a very heavy TMD topic. It can get very confusing. I definitely wouldn't have understood this episode very well as a young dentist, but to get the exposure is really, really good to this kind of stuff. And the more seasoned clinicians who are into the TMD, I think this one, you're going to be really, really finding this one very stimulating in terms of the, the different facets the conversation goes in and the, the both the beauty and the frustration of having so many different treatment philosophies. The protrusion dental pearl I have for this episode is my history form. You can totally just download my full history form that I send to all my patients before they come to see me for a TMD consultation. You'll appreciate how much detail I like to have even before the patient sits in the chair. If you're a premium subscriber, you can just scroll below and you'll see the PDF there. But if you're not a premium subscriber yet, I found you a way to access it. You can go to protrusive.co.uk forward slash TMD history. That's TMD dash history. That will take you to my history form for patients. And of course, I'll put the link in the show notes for YouTube and Spotify. Before we dive into the main episode, I just wanted to thank Patrick Grossman for inviting me into his home to record this. I've been on some training with him and I appreciated the what he was saying was very different to what I'd been hearing or reading in the textbooks and some other great people that I follow. And so I, I like the fact that I've got so much exposure from various different clinicians and various different camps. And, and it's all really forming part of my journey in trying to do the really best I can in TMD for my my patients. And it's with great pleasure that I'm able to pass this on to you guys with this very insightful conversation, which has a few twists and turns along the way. This one might need a, a, a couple of uh, commutes to actually finish, but I'll catch you in the outro. Dr. Patrick Grossman, it is my great pleasure to welcome you on to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, a rare face-to-face -face one. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm very well and a happy new year to you. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, this is going to be quite an important episode. Now, you have been someone I've looked up to as the, the <laughs> you're not gonna like, okay, I'm gonna change my term. I've been really careful uh, the terms I use, but someone who's got a lot of experience in treating uh, lots of types of conditions. You know, you're an orthodontist by training, right? Yes, correct. And then you took a liking because I was at your live lecture that you did, and you talked about your journey about what inspired you to go into the realms yeah. uh, of temporal mandibular disorder. Yeah. So for those listening, just give us. Um, I've given a little bit of an introduction already in my intro, but just tell us about what got you into this field. Well, it's fascinating, really. I, I qualified back in the mid-70s and uh, studied and got my Diploma of Orthodontics here in London. And then I went to Germany, where they were doing a lot of work on dentofacial orthopedics. And I spent time there. When I came back, I dedicated myself to orthodontics and went to every course that I could find. And I went one Saturday to a functional jaw orthopedic seminar at the Thistler Hotel down at the Tower of London. It was a Saturday. And, and this everybody, is like functional appliances? Only functional appliances. Yeah. 
And everybody was anybody was there at the time, you know, John Mew and uh, David Tobias and uh, Hans Iron, and lots of other people. And came five o'clock and I was really getting tired. And I thought, well, I'd really like to get out and go and have a drink. And on the stage comes this huge guy, American guy, and he puts up a slide of a patient who could barely open their mouth, clutching their face. And he said, this is a patient in pain who needs orthodontics, how are you going to treat them? And mm-hmm. everybody said, oh, no, I don't even send it to the oral surgeon or whatever. And then he said something really interesting. He said, how about if you could treat this patient for their limited opening and their pain and then do the orthodontics? Anyway, the rest of the lecture, I was spellbound. It was one hour. And it was at that time, it's one incident like that, that made me realize all the years of orthodontics are great, but orthodontics is only a means to the end. It's not the end. And in a way, once you see the truth about something, if you're honest with yourself, there's no going back. And so now I realize I'm going to have to change everything I learn. And that also included the idea about early treatment as opposed to waiting till all the permanent teeth have erupted. So that was another huge step. So the practice became one which was dedicated to early treatment. Even now, we will be talking about that. So we're, yeah. we're kind of splitting into two. Uh, in this segment, we'll, we'll talk about TMD, the management, sure. etiology, yeah. what perhaps out there which you feel is against your philosophy. And then I want you to uh, share your philosophy with the world. But then uh, another part two, we'll talk about interceptive, because I did do one recently with an American dentist and she was brilliant. But a lot of the UK dentists are like, okay, that's great. But what do we do here in the UK where a lot of our specialists are, are not taught to really get involved and inceptive and and Mm -hmm. the NHS is not really well funded and all these uh, problems whatnot. So we'll definitely talk about that. Now, you mentioned uh, about having diverse training early on, even within orthodontics, before you were uh, were enlightened by that lecture and that inspired you. Yes. In the years of training in orthodontics, Mm -hmm. how much emphasis was was put on actual the joint diagnosis and, and TMJ health? Virtually nothing at all. Virtually nothing at all. Uh, my eyes were only open to this from this lecture by Dr. Brendan Stack back in the late 80s, early 90s. And since then, you know, I just had to really spend a lot of time in the States uh, on a yearly basis with him and with others, um, really studying uh, how to treat the TM joint uh, as well as the orthodontics that goes with it because there are different techniques that are needed once you've uh, corrected the uh, internal derangements. So very little was taught here. There was a little bit done here, but not in a way that made any intellectual sense to me. So really, until I studied with Brendan, none of the philosophies really made sense to me as to how to treat. And uh, he he came up with this uh, orthopedic approach to treating TMD. Uh, he founded the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain back in 1984, 85. And so he was right there at the inception. Also, of course, in the mid 80s, uh, MRI scanning came in for the TM joint, although it was uh, it was developed earlier, but only for TMD was it available in the mid 80s. So this is the way that we moved uh, the, the subject forward from an orthopedic point of view. Now, you mentioned, Patrick, that in your orthodontic training, there wasn't much uh, available. In my restorative training, there was, but it was basic. But I think it's important for anyone who's doing tooth wear cases or changing the vertical dimension to have a really good understanding or at least know the red flags, know that, okay, I should not proceed. And the way I see orthodontics is full mouth rehab in enamel, right? That's orthodontics. And therefore, what got me into the management of TMDs is learning to assess the health and get a a joint diagnosis, whether it's safe for me as a restorative dentist to continue and to do my orthodontics, because I I do orthodontics as well, Uh, not to the level that you ever did, but the GDP orthodontics. Uh, And before I could continue, I needed to know what the joints were like. And that, that spiraled into me actually helping patients with their TMDs. But the problem that we have in, 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 in all countries, I guess, but let's just talk about the UK, is the hospitals that I worked at and what exposure I got in terms of the way that we're managing temporomandibular joint disorders in, in hospital is very much the following. You take history, you take an OPG for whatever reason, because everyone just gets an OPG, which, even, yeah, which, you know, we know that that has limited value. It's not that it has no value, but limited value. MRIs are definitely a, a distant thing in, in the pecking order, you know. And then usually, no matter what the diagnosis is, well, firstly, the diagnosis is usually TMD. There's no subset. Is it myogenic? Is it a capsule? Which we'll talk about here, because they're, they're, they're managed differently. 
And because there's no accurate diagnosis, everyone just gets a bite raising appliance. That's like the first tick box, mm -hmm. a soft bite guard. And then some of those will get better. And then those remaining ones, oh, let's go for Botox, let's go for this. If you accidentally or happen to fall in the hands of someone who actually is confident will know what they're doing. And then the, the problem we have is that there's so many different philosophies and then mm. patients get confused. Mm -hmm. No, I totally understand that. I, I think that's a, it's a really hit and miss approach, this uh, way that patients are treated uh, in the hospital system. But, you know, there are difficulties in the hospital system and within the NHS. So I understand their limitations. I think that what you said just earlier really puts the case in perspective, and that is the diagnosis. How can we treat unless we have a diagnosis? I mean... If somebody comes in with caries, you don't give them paracetamol. You try and find out what the cause is. And with any aspect of dentistry, you're really trying to delve in to find out where does this come from or what, you know, what's the cause, and then we can treat it. So the idea of trying this and it doesn't work and then trying that, that I think has got the treatment of TMD a really bad reputation, not just here, but also in other parts of the world. So from my point of view, I totally agree that you need to take a history uh, I don't agree about taking uh, an OPG as a routine Let, procedure. Let's talk about that a, a because, second because some dentists are, are trained that, okay, yeah. some, most dentists that I know, they get a little bit panicky when they see an emergency TMD and they, they don't know what to do. They yeah. just, t they, they default to an OPG because they, okay, I can see the condyle and they usually then yeah. Yeah. don't really notice anything. Yeah. So why should we stop taking routine OPGs? Uh, I think everybody who treats a lot of patients with TMD and this experience in it will tell you that the OPG just tells you that the teeth there, there's bones there and there are condyles there, but it actually only tells you about the hard tissue. And the whole problem with musculoskeletal disorders, of which TMD is one, is that we need to image the soft tissues. Now, if you go to any orthopedic physician or surgeon, the first thing they do with a bad shoulder and neck or an ankle or back or whatever it is, they don't take x-rays, they take an MRI scan. Because the modern MRI scan not only shows the soft tissue, but by taking different images, you can also get a very good idea of the bone. And in the patients that we treated over the last 30 years, we rarely had to take an x-ray uh, to substantiate our diagnosis after the MRI has been taken. So that's... It's, it's an access issue, isn't it, Patrick? It is an access issue. And that's why maybe they take an OPG, but it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't really add much to your but, diagnosis. But it doesn't add anything. And also, what you do with information that you've got, that the patient's got two condyles, how does that help you treat the patient? It doesn't, because it doesn't tell you anything about the muscles. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going inside within the joint capsule. So, you know... I think it's a very limited value. And that's really been shown now in many papers that uh, uh, taking an OPG is really, really virtually a waste of time mm -hmm. for this particular problem. So my first interjection here to add a little bit more context, whereby I'm really annoyed that sometimes when I have to refer to the hospital service for the management of temporomandibular disorders, either because the patient can't afford my fees, or I really need a bit more remotely disciplinary, I need an OMFS input here, that they want is a prerequisite to have an OPG. I think that's a, a real shame, actually, because if someone's got just clicking, popping, the occasional locking, then just like we've discussed here, very rarely will you find the clues or the answers from an OPG? I think for the vast majority, it's irradiating these patients for no reason. And only in a, in a few patients will you find an actual pathology that truly is part of the problem. So it's quite rare. I experienced this uh, when I was in hospital uh, doing a training post and a patient came in with a deranged mandible. I really freaked out. I was like, why is this patient's mandible all the way up to one side? And so I took an OPG because it's what I was told to do as a trainee. And my consultant, who's quite hot on TMD, he said, Jazz, why did you take an OPG? I was like, well, you know, I, I thought it'd be good to, to see the, the condyles and the TMJ anatomy and make sure it's okay. And he explained to me that actually this was a myospasm of the lateral pterygoid, which is why the jaw was off to one side. And just as he suspected, the OPG didn't really tell us anything, didn't really add any value because you can't see soft tissues, you can't see muscles, you can't see the disc. Now, I've also seen it in my practice where patients come for a second opinion. I've seen some you know previous plans that have been given. And some of these comment on the appearance of the condyles on the OPG radiograph, the fact that they are slightly different in size, and this may be potentially part of the problem and part of the reason why this patient's having headaches and, and clicking. 
Well, have we considered that actually it might be a positional error? Like if you're an OPG machine and you turn your head a little bit more to one side, the condyles will look asymmetric. It's the same if you bring your head you know, too far forward or if you tilt it, the condyles will not look the same. So we have to be very careful in our interpretation and actually drawing conclusions from an OPG. It's not to say that they don't have a place in TMD diagnosis at all, like they sometimes do when you're looking for that kind of bony pathology, if that's part of your differential diagnosis. But it's not something that we should be taking as a routine. Now, recently I emailed Mr. Andrew Sidebottom. You may remember him from PDP 118 when we talked about what happens when your splints fail, what happens when conservative care fails and the surgeons have to come in. Now, he said that he sometimes uses OPGs as a screening tool to exclude a dental cause, i.e. he's not really looking at the condyles per se, he's looking, is there potentially a wisdom tooth that could be causing an issue? Sometimes you have a differential diagnosis, is it TMD, is it a wisdom tooth issue? And in that same audit, they only found TMJ changes in 1% of the cases. So really, if we're taking routine OPGs, we're looking for that 1%. This is not worth radiation, in my opinion. Now, as you listen on throughout this episode, we will touch on MRIs and why I think they are good, but they have a lot of flaws and issues, which I will elaborate on later on this episode. Yes, yeah, agreed. And let's just talk about the different diagnoses that we can make as a you know, general dentist. What are, you know, it's no longer TMD, it shouldn't be TMD, it's an umbrella term. So what are the main, obviously we can't go through exhaustive the diagnostic criteria, but are the main categories of diagnosis we can make? And then my next question will be after that is, what do you think in your years of seeing patients? Because etiology is you know, thrown out as genetic and this and that. What have you noticed in patterns? But before that, just diagnoses, please. I think that the way that I studied with Brendan Stack, and I need to go back to talking about him because very, very few people have had the really the privilege that I did with some other of my colleagues from Ireland to go to Brendan's practice in uh, Vienna, Virginia, just outside uh, Georgetown, Washington, and spend up to a week, a year with him in his surgery where he had five chairs and was treating from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock at night. And the beauty of that was that every year we went back, we kept seeing the same patients. So we were following his patients and we will be going back there for 20 years. So we have seen a lot of patients and most of the patients that are on his website, although sadly he died a couple of years ago, he still has a website with videos. We've seen those patients. So what he used to say, and is absolutely true really, is that muscle problems within the TMD, muscle spasm, is secondary to disc displacement. So Annika Eisberg, a wonderful researcher from Umea University in Sweden, she did a PhD back in the mid-1980s when she was told by her professor that uh, clicking joints is a variation of normal. Well, we can talk about that. That just is not the case. I mean, something is either pathological or it isn't. You're either pregnant or you're not. You can't have it all ways. So she did an EMG study to show that every time the intraarticular disc was displaced, the muscles in and around the joint, temporalis, lateral pterygoid mass, all these muscles that she measured, went into spasm. Every time the disc was back in its correct position, the muscles were relaxed. Mm -hmm. Now you'll begin to see how I am thinking about treating mm -hmm. patients. I'm not treating muscles mm -hmm. because I know muscles are responding to some other problem. So all joints are straddled by skeletal muscles. So if, for example, I dislocate my shoulder, the reason I got pain is the body tries to put the articulating surfaces back into mm -hmm, mm -hmm. intimate contact so that they can function again. That's why the muscles go into spasm, get tight and painful. Would you agree that if you treat the, if you aim to treat the muscles in someone who has a combined intracapsular and muscular element, that really what you're doing is you're almost putting a plaster on the situation, the muscles might feel better, yeah. but the internal derangement still persists. Exactly. But, but because it's now got to a level where yep. it's no longer symptomatic, yes. but it could be again be in the future. Yep. Whereas what you're saying is that perhaps if we treat the internal, internal derangement at the same time, mm -hmm. then that could be more stable? It will definitely be more stable because actually what you're doing is putting back the bits mm -hmm. in their correct anatomical position which is what we try to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we do in dentistry. Mm -hmm. You know, we try and recreate the tooth contour or whatever, whether we're doing a crown and bridge or whatever. 
Um, so the same applies to the joint. And it's an orthopedic principle that you don't just manage the symptoms. And yes, of course, we use physiotherapy. It's an adjunctive uh, treatment and we use laser and soft laser and all other aspects as well if we need it. But the main thing is to get the structure and the anatomy right, because if we know what is the correct anatomy of the joint, we need to get that back to where it should be, the way God intended it to be. And that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. That said, the success rate, if you do it like that, is very high. It's not 100%, nothing is. But that's the only way that treating a patient with TMD made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm studying with Brenda for over 25 years and saw it. And then doing it myself, I realized this is the only way that makes sense to me. And it makes sense to the patient. The mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. you show them how the joint works and what you're trying to do, they go, aha. Mm -hmm. well, why didn't the other person tell me? Why did he say I should try this or try that? Mm -hmm. So I said, look, I don't know. But this is the way we do it. And it's the way it makes sense. And it's very important for the patient to be seduced is the wrong word. They need to be uh, lead, led. led. Leadership. You need some leadership. Absolutely. To, 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 to At inform. the first consultation, you only get one chance. You only get one chance at a first impression, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the, that first consultation is absolutely paramount. If that goes well, the chances are the rest of the treatment will. If it doesn't go well, mm -hmm. it's really, really difficult. Okay. Well, what I've experienced in, in my practice so far of a, a decade and much less of that, she just focused more around TMD. So this is why I, I seek to you, I come to you for guidance and mentorship is the, the general patients I have, my own patients on whom I make a diagnosis of myogenic TMD. Yep. And their intercaps component is very minimal. Right. And when I help them with an occlusal appliance therapy, or occlusal adjustment, whatever, and that's it, they're, they're, they're in, a, in a good place now. But the patients I get on referral or who seek me out, they are much more in the intercaps, they're much more complex. And that's where I, I, I do believe in everything you're saying in terms of, okay, let's treat the, the joint, yeah. get that in the right position. But to... To be de play devil's, devil's advocate with you, perhaps what uh, other people have said to you in the past is, well, if you go around taking MRIs and everyone, we know that a lot of people will have disc displacement with, or yeah. even sometimes without reduction, with no issues at all, yeah. which then takes you very nicely to them. What do you then believe causes mm -hmm. someone to become symptomatic, causes someone to seek care? What is yeah. the etiology of the TMD that you find in front of you? Well, uh, a lot of studies have been done, and you're absolutely right. There are some asymptomatic volunteers who, who have disc displacement and they're asymptomatic. The problem is how long these patients can be followed up. And, and there's research to show that, you know, if you have 30, in a cohort of, let's say, 100 patients and 30 have asymptomatic TMD with displacement and no symptoms, within 10 years, they probably will go on to develop symptoms. Now, the symptoms they develop may not be TMD. They may not be pain in around the joint or limited opening. It could be headaches. It could be ear-related things. So, of course, they're going then to different practitioners. They're going to the EMT people or to, to chiropractors, people like that. So I'm not sure about that. Okay, guys, I'm interjecting again, and this is a tough one. This one took me a long time to be able to break down and, and make some notes in terms of how I can make this friendly for a podcast or a video, however you're choosing to tune into this episode. This is the part where the episode kind of takes a twist. Like, I, you know, I respect Dr. Patrick Grossman, but there are some different viewpoints that we have, which sometimes I look at myself and I think, you know, do I have the right in front of someone so experienced like, like, like Patrick to, to have a different viewpoint to him? But actually, when you look at the literature and people's experiences, especially uh, with TMD being this Wild West, there's so many different approaches that I've seen, that I've learned from. And there are definitely people who will be uh, backing up Dr. Grossman saying, yes, this is absolutely true. And there are some people who say, actually, no, you know, there is an alternative mechanism in terms of what's happening here. So let me let me just explain this in just a couple of minutes. Wish me luck. Now, let's start with Dr. Grossman saying that all muscular issues are secondary to a disc displacement. Now, if some of our younger colleagues are watching this, what is a disc displacement? It is basically when there is a, like a click, right? A click is an example of a disc displacement. The, the disc starts usually, for example, and very often in a forward position to the condyle. Now, it can be forward and off to one side, but for simplicity sake, let's say the disc is no longer on the condyle. And as the condyle rotates and translates, so the mouth opening happens, you hear a click. And that click is the disc coming back on to the condyle. So that is like a disc displacement. That particular example I gave you is a disc displacement with reduction, i.e. the disc reduces back on to the condyle. It doesn't reduce, doesn't mean becomes less. It's like when you reduce a fracture, you join it together, right? So that's a disc displacement. 
And according to what uh, Patrick believes, because we you know we're, we're buds on, on WhatsApp and we discuss cases, he is a strong believer that actually it's everything to do with the disc and the muscles follow the disc. Now, I have to say in my experience that this is true for some patients. I have found this to be the case for some patients. But I would say that most patients that actually once you get the muscles calm, the disc issue still continues. Like there might still be clicking, but they're clicking painlessly. Have you ever seen a patient that's got a painless click? I'm sure you have. It's actually very, very common, right? Where I work in Reading, uh, my general patients, I treat a patient base that is more elderly. So I see and feel and hear all sorts of crepitus, those crunchy sounds and clickings and pops and take their history of, oh yeah, I used to have clicking, popping and that kind of stuff. So the general patient that I have definitely display clicking, but thankfully they are asymptomatic. Now, because I see lots of TMD patients on referral and self-referral, I see the symptomatic end of it as well. So it can't be as straightforward as disc displacement, muscle issues, or, or that disc displacement is a pathology. Like it, is a, it is a pathology, and I'll, I'll, I'll agree to that, that it is, in an ideal world, we want the disc on the condyle. But I would suggest that there is a degree of biologic variability. And this is also what uh, Professor Danielle Manfredini in Italy would agree with, and also Dr. Jeff Oakson from the USA. In fact, here's a snippet from PDP 080 where I had Dr. Jim McKee, and we discussed about the Piper classification. Hear what he had to say about a Piper 3A, which basically means the disc is slightly forward and to the side, but part of the disc is still covering the condyle, so it is a disc displacement. There will still be a click, but this may not be progressive. The classification system is misunderstood as a progressive disorder. But if I have someone who's a 3A unstable, most of the time, if they don't have another joint injury, they'll stay that way their whole life usually. Now, the other thing to consider to, to sort of counteract or play devil's advocate in terms of making a balanced argument in this episode is that I have seen, is that I have seen, because I've sent these patients for MRIs when they have pure muscular TMD. And for one reason or another, we end up having an MRI of the TMJs. It showed perfectly healthy, beautiful joints on the MRI, yet quite severe muscular temporomandibular disorder. We're thinking lots of mastiff pain, lots of temporalis pain referred pain to the teeth and beyond. And this is also echoed by TMJ physiotherapist, my colleague Krina, for example. In her experience of treating lots of TMD patients, she's found that disc displacement and muscular pain can coincide, but it's not always that the muscular pain is secondary to a disc displacement. However, once again, I do and I have, and I will see some patients whereby I strongly agree with Patrick Grossman here that in that cohort of patients, this is part of the issue because they keep locking and popping that elongation and the reflex of the muscle and the spasm it can go into, that can be part of an issue. And once you stabilize the displacement, it helps the muscles to stabilize. So I don't think there's a black and white here. I think there's a gray area, but I definitely wouldn't go say that all muscle issues are secondary to a displacement, which some colleagues like Patrick believe, and that's totally fine. And this is what we're here to discuss. Now, I looked at this iceberg study that, that Patrick quoted. It was with 15 patients. So the issue that we have with the evidence base in TMD is there's lots of case reports and 30 patients, 20 patients, that kind of stuff. But we don't have the big numbers and we don't have follow-ups. And there's a lot of differences in the populations, the big age ranges. So it's difficult to get a good data. All the bigger studies, the systematic reviews and meta-analyses, they all say that we need more studies. Now, back to the iceberg study, 15 patients who had signs and symptoms. Now, this EMG spike that Patrick described, this was observed in nine of the 15 patients. So not all these patients with their, this disc displacement exhibited this EMG spike. And what's interesting is 10 months later, when 11 of these 15 patients were reviewed again, and while so 10 of these still had signs and symptoms, now this one didn't state in the paper where the painless clicking would, would count. And I believe that in some patients it was a matter of just painless clicking. Anyway, at review, only two of these patients actually showed this EMG spike. So still had displacement, still had signs and symptoms, but this time when the study was repeated at 10 months, there was only two patients who exhibited this EMG spike. So I think there's a lot to say about biological variability and how EMG data may not correlate with signs and symptoms. Like I'm someone who does quite a few anterior midpoint stop appliances. And I would love for the data to show that what I'm trying to do here is reduce the, the muscle contractions of the anterior temporalis and the, and the master. And the EMG studies show that yes, we can reduce the contraction of the temporalis and master muscles. But the studies, again, with the low end numbers show that this did not improve the patients. In my own population of patients where I carefully select them, I've seen AMSAs very successful. In fact, on the splint course, loads of delegates email me all the time 
time saying how AMSAs have changed their practice and how they've been able to help their patients with headaches and, 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 and jaw issues that they've had for lingered for many, many years, thanks to using bee splints appropriately and safely. But the evidence base would not agree with this at this moment in time. And so unfortunately, everything we have to take with a pinch of salt, even though my clinical experiences have said that AMSAs are very, very helpful to my patients with myogenic pain, the studies say otherwise. Which is why I also think Patrick Grossman's values are very important. His experiences are important because one third of evidence-based dentistry is the clinician's experience. So we can't take this lightly. Now, this concept of variability and adaptability is something that Patrick himself just mentions in, in the next bit. What I do know uh, is that everybody has a sort of limit to what the, the body can cope with till the straw breaks the camel's back. Adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity, and that's impossible to measure. It seems to be that men very rarely in my years of uh, practice uh, complained of pain coming from the TM joint. They would have other issues like bruxism and reduced opening and so on, but pain wasn't one. Pain to me is also not a very good indicator of pathology. Mm, you can have a lump in the breast, it doesn't hurt. You can have a brain tumor, you don't have any pain till the rest. You can have casting over the tongue that doesn't have any pain till uh, later on. So pain is not a great indicator. What we're interested in is pathology. What I do know is that the patients who have disc displacement with pain and other problems benefit very well. Mm -hmm. The question about what you do if you're going to undertake, let's say, 20, 30,000 pound work of dentistry on patients who have internal derangement and are asymptomatic, you just have to tell them, you know, if you develop symptoms, I may have to redo the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that in Stax practice. People would have a full mouth rehab done and they start breaking all the crowns and he takes an MRI and says, you're off the disc and things aren't okay. And you've got to have it all done again. The woman said, well, I just spent 80, 90,000 pounds. He said, well, madam, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. Which brings me on to one really important intellectual point that nobody really talks about. We know that there is a disc in that joint. Mm -hmm. And we know where the disc ought to be yep. from autopsy, from thousands of years of anatomy and so on. The question now is that every dentist has to ask for himself, not just an orthodontist, is does it matter? where the disc is when you treat a patient. In other words, are you treating your patient on or off the disc? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Now, if you're an orthodontist and you're moving 24, 28 teeth around simultaneously and it's your child, would you prefer to do that on healthy joints where you know everything's in the right place or it doesn't matter? That's I something know, we need to decide as a profession, don't we? That's absolutely right. It doesn't make sense to me to treat off the disc. It doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not biologically correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whether you get away with it is another thing. It's up to every individual to decide what you're going to do. You know, if it's just a class one amalgam, does it matter? But if you're doing a full mouth rehab or you're doing implants and orthodontics, now... That brings me on to something really, really interesting, and that is the case back in the mid-1980s of Brim versus Malloy in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where a teenager girl went in for orthodontic treatment, had premolars extracted, had headgear, and after the appliances were removed, complained of intractable headaches and TMJ pain, and then had some wisdom teeth out as well, and everything mm -hmm. got worse. And the case was brought against the orthodontist and the plaintiff won about a million dollars. And that threw the entire orthodontic profession into complete uh, uh, turmoil because the argument by Witzig, who was the uh, plaintiff's expert witness, was you don't expect to go in for orthodontic treatment and come out with straight teeth but feeling really bad with lots of symptoms. And that's where it all started. And that's when the orthodontic community got together and started to find ways of publishing, which they've done very successfully. Lots of papers show that orthodontics has nothing to do with TMD. Well, you know, if you look at the that, stomatic yeah, nathic I mean, system... I mean, orth orth I mean, they say orthodontics has nothing to do, but that's like saying the position of the teeth, the way the teeth meet together has nothing to do. It's the same as saying that, right? It's nothing to do with the static occlusion. It's to do with what happens functionally and whether the mandible or shifts how, on how, closely. Yeah, how it reaches the static. Exactly. It's not whether it's class one, class two, class three, none of that. No. It's how the mandible gets to its final position mm -hmm. of intercuspation mm -hmm. and the intercuspation of the final position of the mandible and the shift of the mandible will be dictated to by the arrangement of the upper and lower teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which obviously has a huge bearing on the, on the two joints. Well, that's why I tried to, to put forward the, 
go back, you know, to, to, to first principles, but we talk about the stomatic nervic system, and people say, well, what's that? Well, it's basically three elements that have to work beautifully together as a system. And those three elements are the two TM joints, the muscles, and the teeth. Mm -hmm. And then I have been thinking recently about, well, what is the most important part of the stomatic nervic system? Well, babies don't have teeth, and a lot of dentalist people don't have teeth. So but if your muscles and your joints don't work, mm -hmm. like if you're born with some of these craniofacial deformities, you really can't function. So yes, of course, the teeth are important once they're there, but the foundations for me are the muscles and the joints. And mm -hmm. now we've got to get the teeth to be in harmony with those two other f parts of the stomatic nervic system. Well said. And I think it raises a really good question that I have now is whether we're treating on the disc or off the disc. Because one question that we get in the restorative circles is, can you treat a patient with a clicky joint? Can you safely raise their vertical dimension and do a full mouth rehab? And you kind of touched on it. Well, what if they have problems later on? Wouldn't, you have, wouldn't it have been better if they were on the disc and you treated them? But my, my only then, there's a gray area. And if we look at the, the Piper classification, which me as a restorative background, I, I favor the Piper compared to the Wilkes, is if the medial pole is in the, the right position and it's a lateral pole that's out because it's not braced, it's, it's not yeah. supported. And you can get a repeatable position, repeatable mm -hmm, bite, mm -hmm. and every time you do a central relation record, it, it's fine. Is it, do, you, do you feel as though it's a sin for a sore dentist to accept a asymptomatic click that's been there for many, many years and then proceed to treatment? Or do you feel as though that patient should have that click fully eliminated and, and that lateral pole in the right position before commencing major work? Well, luckily I've never <laughs> had to make that decision because I've never done full mouth rehabs. Uh, the well, thing you have is, though, you've done orthodontics. Well, yes, I have. <laughs> but um, we haven't followed those patients through long enough. I think that, that that's the answer. I mean, I don't know. One would have to really decide and tell the patient what's what and then see what happens years down the road. Uh, would I do it? I prefer not to because... If I know that everything's in the right position, then I know medico-legally also, I've done the very best I can. Whether you get away with an asymptomatic click, I don't know. It, it's very similar to a lot of people who say, oh, well, you can do a pull forward splint, you know, uh, to, to, to recapture the disc. And then what you do is you walk them back. And then what you do is you take it out and you, you just use it now and then. So all you've done is you've taken them from a symptomatic position to an asymptomatic position. You're now putting them back to where the pathological position was. And people say, oh, yes, but, you know, in the meantime, they formed a pseudo disc and the retrodiscal tissue and the bilaminar zone is all stiffened up and so on. But that's still, to me, a bit of a cop out. So what but you're suggesting is if you do, if you do phase one and yeah. then wean off the phase one and don't proceed to the phase two and actually bringing the teeth to the new position where the, the disc likes to be. So guys, let's just reflect here on something very important Patrick said, which is a symptomatic patient, okay? When you do a pull forward splint, which is a type of like an anterior repositioning splint, bringing the mandible forward. So it's kind of like getting the condyles on the discs again, right? And then let's say the patient's pain goes away. Now, sometimes I'd argue, and some of my mentors would argue, that perhaps it wasn't the fact that the condyles on the disc that resulted in the pain go away. Sometimes there's other mechanisms at play. But let's assume that's what's happened. Now, what Patrick said is that when you actually take the splint away and then you walk the condyles back, so the condyles go back to their normal position, then you're putting them back in that sort of uh, symptomatic position again. Now, this may be, be true for some patients, right? But the key word here is symptomatic patient because... If we do go down the phase two approach, basically, phase one is when you bring the jaw forward, you're trying to capture the disc, okay? And then if you stay at phase one, that means you're just holding on that splint, which holds the jaw forward, or you take out the splint and you go back to normal. Phase two would be that when your jaw is now forward and your discs are now captured, you are now doing something to the teeth, like orthodontics, for example, or restorative to hold that position. Now that the condyles are quote unquote in the right position, what can we now do to the teeth to keep them in the right position? Now, uh, Patrick, being a very skilled orthodontist, the way he would do it is he would actually do ortho, extrude the molars, and get everything to meet together with the condyles in this forward position with the discs recaptured. Now, after having been on Patrick's course, which I would recommend because it's really great to get a different perspective uh, and to learn from someone with so much experience, and what he, what he showed was cases whereby things could take a lot of time. 
to achieve those orthontic movements to get the posterior teeth to meet together can take a long time. Now, if you throw surgery into the mix, i.e. someone's got a disc displacement without reduction, and now you're uh, doing disc plication, which is like suturing or, or stapling, for, to, for want of a better word, uh, the, the disc back onto the condyle, right? Uh, and then you're doing this therapy whereby you're bringing the, the condyle into the right position, and then you're doing the orthodontics or the prosthodontics. It can cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Now, we're talking years here. So I think the juice must be worth the squeeze. So if someone is asymptomatic, surely we shouldn't be doing something so drastic just in order to get uh, the disc in the right position if your patient is asymptomatic to begin with. The other thing to consider is are there ways that this patient could be treated a bit more conservatively? Like, I do think there is totally a place for this kind of treatment, which Patrick is very skilled at doing, but I think there's also a place for, for what I do, which is basically following a pyramid. Do the most conservative things first and escalate upwards. This may be a classical uh, stabilization splint, for example, and relying on this pseudo disc formation, which I know that Patrick isn't the biggest fan of, but there are lots of camps that would say that actually this is a suitable way to go. So which way you treat it, I feel like we need some clearer guidelines, some good research, because like I said before, the bigger papers all say that we need more studies, we need more trials, we need some data over long periods of time to see how our patients do. And this can be very, very tricky. One mentor I've learned with is Dr. Jameson Spencer in America, and he says that uh, for a patient to get treatment, especially if it's more aggressive treatment or irreversible treatment, they must have PDQ. So PDQ stands for pain, dysfunction, a quality of life issue. So one of the three or all three, for example, uh, and that should be the basis of treatment. If they don't have PDQ, then why are you doing the treatment? And I, I quite like that philosophy, and I like to explain to my patients who are worried about asymptomatic clicks. The other thing to consider about pain is the more I've been learning about pain, especially the last four to five years, you really learn that pain is a very complex beast. And when pain develops this characteristic called chronicity, whereby it's been there for so long and your nerve signals are firing, even though perhaps that trauma or the thing that was causing the pain is now gone, but the pain signals still persist and how pain is regulated by so much more than just trauma. It makes me as a clinician worried about doing irreversible things in the hope of overcoming pain because learning how chronic pain works means that even though you can get things anatomically correct, the pain can still continue. So the biggest thing that I advocate nowadays is something called symptoms modification. This means that I will try to do some sort of reversible conservative therapy. This could be an appliance. This could be any, even an appliance that Patrick would do. I would do something similar to him to first check that we get the patient out of pain. And I know that Patrick does this as well. He, he gets his patients, he puts them on his pull forward splint, he gets these discs reduced, and once the pain settles, then he considers his phase two, and that's the way it should be. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that I might try to do this phase one without having to bring the jaw forward, if, if it's possible for that case. And it's difficult to make sweeping statements when we don't have a specific case in front of us, because each case brings with it so much variability is what I found. But if there's a way that I can use a splint that is perhaps permissive, like a stabilization splint along with some physio or an AMSA if it's appropriate for those kind of patients. And if you can improve the patient scores and get rid of that P, D and Q, then perhaps we can avoid that phase two and persist with the regime that has modified the symptoms. The other thing that I've just remembered that Dr. Jameson Spencer taught me is that when you bring someone's jaw forward and you try to get the condyles back on the disc, the way he famously says it is that it could take a peanut on a salad to undo all this hard work. So how stable is it long term? Well, this is why the uh, anterior repositioning splints data is a little bit worrying that actually the stability of that position long term may not be so good. But with Patrick argues that actually if you do that therapy and then follow it up with the orthodontics or the phase two to try and keep that jaw in the forward position, then that might be the secret source to getting higher success rates and, and more stability. But I personally have not seen this long-term uh, successful data whereby phase two has been carried out and we've had good stability at five years or 10 years. Now, when you look in some studies, especially from this textbook, which I'm holding, those of you watching the video, those of you listening, it's a Jeff Oakson's Temporal Mandibular Disorders and Occlusion uh, Edition 8. And what it shows, uh, as well as doing some background reading, is when they have done phase one and phase two. So they brought the jaw forward, they got rid of the clicks and the pain improved. And then they did the orthodontics or the prosthodontic therapy or the occlusal adjustments to keep it at that new position. 
what they found over time is that at the interval period, so a lot of these studies are three years, four years, six years, they found that they were 80% and above successful for pain, which is amazing. So if you're a patient in pain and you're going to have this therapy done of bringing the jaw forward and having some orthodontics and 80% of the time, then amazing. You know, it's worked and 20% of the time, well, you know, that's biology. That's how it works. Whereas if you actually have a look at the click, so have you successfully eliminated the click long term? The same study found that the click returned in about 50 to 70% of cases. So, so let me repeat that again. Pain, it helped a lot when you follow it up as well, but the click returned. The pain was still gone, but the click returned. So let's, let's, let's think about it. The click has returned, the displacement is, is back again, but you don't have pain anymore. So perhaps could there have been a way that the treatment could have been done without the phase two and to live with the click, for example, but manage the pain, just like what the data showed for the, the more uh, aggressive therapy. Now, this is just some, some wide overarching examples I'm giving. Patrick shows some very nice cases uh, in which he made a huge difference in people's lives with his treatments. So this is why I encourage learning from everyone, especially if you're interested in this field of TMD, which is, uh, you know, I love it, but it is uh, very overwhelming, I think, in terms of the, the different mentors I've had like I've, I've, I've learned a little bit of ortho here I've learned lots of restorative which I love but the differing opinions I've had uh, in terms of what's the best management technique in the, in the realms of TMD is immense in terms of wide variation of the great clinicians that we have out there which is why I personally now default to what is the most conservative of the two or three treatment philosophies that I have available and I explain this to my patients I, I get them on board or at least I give them the option like look I can treat you this way but here's my reservations about being more aggressive. Uh, I'd like to treat you in this less aggressive way. And here's my uh, working out. I'm a big fan of always sharing my working out to the patients in anything I do, restorative treatment uh, or, or TMD, show your working out. Then Absolutely. you're perhaps missing the benefit. Absolutely. Now, uh, this is probably the problem within the literature. Yeah, so the literature it. that I've read about anterior repositioning sits or mandibular advancement splits yes, yeah. is they have good short-term data, mm -hmm. but, but poor long-term data in the sense that what they found was that it relapses. But I'm, what I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that we shouldn't do it. I'm, I may, I'm really suggesting that perhaps the studies weren't designed the right way, they haven't been carried out correctly. You'll probably know more about that. What do you think about the studies? Because they are something that we look at for guidance and a lot of people then get shy away from going into it because they, well, it's not going to work. It's not going to be stable in well, five years' time. I mean, there may be studies. Out there. I've got a lot of, uh, within these four cabinets here, I've got hundreds of uh, articles, uh, some done in the 80s by Williamson to show long-term results of an anterior reposition are, are very, very good. It, what is really important is that once the anterior repositioning appliance has done its job, and it's an orthopedic appliance, it's not moving teeth, mm -hmm. then you have to get the occlusion in sync with the new maxillomandibular relationship because if you're altering the mm -hmm. mandible to the maxilla mm -hmm. and there is the problem in the same way and that's why the orthopedic approach that brendan did because brendan by you know was a university trained orthodontist as well that is why in a way orthodontists are in the ideal position to treat these patients because once you do the splint and then you can fix the teeth mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can do the lot on your own now Obviously, that's not possible because most specialist orthodontists in this country are not even interested in the joint. They don't even know where the joint is. And the and general after, dentists as well. We, and, they want to refer know, out. They don't and, want and, to and see and these they patients. Just want, and most orthodontists just want to make the teeth look pretty and move them up and down an archway. That's why I said for me, when I saw the light, I realized it wasn't the end. It's the means to the end. However, you know, it's a, it's a team effort often. And so if you do the splint... You then try and find an orthodontist you can work with who can do stage two. Now you can give a much better overall treatment uh, for your patients. So that's why I'm really upset that so few orthodontists or people doing orthodontists are not interested in this field. I understand why, though. It's a difficult subject. People don't like treating pain patients who are in pain for a long time. Mm -hmm. and they come with a lot of social problems as well and psychological problems often. So, But this is so rewarding when you can do it. And if you have a scheme and a system that makes sense and it goes through like a cookbook, then you'll get really good results. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that brings us really nicely onto the actual etiological factors. Now, you mentioned already if the, there isn't an optimum position of the disc, that is an etiological factor. Now, we know from the OPERA study yep. about them having an actual biological issue plus 
extreme stress or a, a crisis in their life, yeah, yeah. Uh, plus genetic elements, and there's a whole loads of factors like uh, irritable bowel syndrome and various others, mm -hmm. which are correlated, and, yeah. and, it's, and that makes a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. What are your reflections of when you look back at your career of all the patients that you've had? What are the common themes? Because let's assume yeah. that yes, they have something not quite right in their yeah. articular system, but what actually? What are the other biopsychosocial factors yeah. that you've noticed were, were common? They usually go down the list from bio to psycho to social, right? Except for men, in my experience, who, who have a social problem. For example, I remember having one patient and his wife said, look, you've got to treat my husband because every time he eats, it makes such a loud noise. It's really distressing at the table. So he came for treatment, not because he had pain or anything else. It was a social problem. Usually, though, it starts with some form of pathology. And then with umpteen treatments by various people, People get depressed if they're in pain for more than six months. They do become depressed, whatever problems they have. And becomes chronic pain. Chronic is a huge cr problem. Chronic pain. And then, of course, it becomes a social problem. So all the people around them in the family and their friends, you know, they all know that this person has got terrible pain. They can't go out and, they, and so on and so forth. So it becomes really, really difficult. Going back to your question, which was... What are the different factors that you've noticed in, in all the years? You know, uh, like we looked at the opera study, but yeah. what are the, uh, the classic features of the TMD patient yeah. that you saw? The most common ones are limited mouth opening, painful joints, noise in the joints, headaches, ear-related problems, neck-related problems. And then, of course, knowing the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve, and this is something Brendan did uh, at least 10 years ago with his co-worker Sims, is that they worked out the neurology of what happens in the brainstem when the fibers from the trigeminal nerve enter it. And also what happens there is that they interlace mainly with cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10. And because of that, you get other symptoms in some patients, such as involuntary blinking, Tourette-type symptoms. And probably, because it also affects the vagus nerve, you will get other symptoms related to so, for example, irritable bowel syndrome. So, mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. they're all related to this. Trigeminal is an extremely complex nerve, and I'm not sure we know everything mm -hmm. about it. But a lot of the vessels are innervated in, in, in the cranium by fibers of the trigeminal. So it, it is hugely drive symptoms, hugely. But, but with all the symptoms and the signs that you saw, when we look at why that patient, what happened within that patient that led to them to become symptomatic compared to to very many other people who may have the same sort of joints, skeletal yeah. factors, occlusal yeah. factors, but they didn't become symptomatic. Uh, stress, was that a common? Stress is one, obviously, and, and, and parafunction, mm -hmm. I'm sure, plays a huge role. And all the patients that we treated, we all not only offered them, we all told them they had to wear a night appliance, but a specific type of night appliance in order to protect protect the joint. Because once a joint is weakened, it needs to be looked after for life. It, it, and, and you can't do that with a TM joint other than using an appliance because uh, you don't know what's going to happen in sleep. You can be grinding, clenching. This so isn't so after forth. phase two. After you've achieved everything, this is in phase two? Is that what you this mean? This is in phase one. So they have sure. basically in phase one, they need 24-hour care, which means they have a splint in the daytime yep. and they have a different splint at night. Yep. So 24 hours a day, they're being treated, not just being treated yep. at night like some people. And during are eating? To, and during, absolutely. Every single second of those 24 hours, they have something there to get the joint into the correct position. Because which is obviously, not a stabilization splint, which no, is permissive. No, it's not. No, yeah, no. Yeah. And because the moment you take the splint out, the muscles go back and, and start moving the mandible back to a different position and you've lost it. Mm -hmm. You have to keep the proprioception the same. And that's what makes a successful case, in my view, 24-hour care. Mm -hmm. And then after stage two, when they've had the orthodontics done to get the uh, occlusion in sync with the joint, they get another nighttime appliance for life so, like, to protect that that we can join now what does that nighttime appliance after phase two the protective one what does that look like what can you describe it it's basically a bimaxillary appliance so it sort of looks like a bionator but it isn't it was the one i used was developed by a guy called ralph garcia down in florida whose practice i went to see and it's absolutely magnificent basically what it does is it holds the maxilla and the mandible in such a position that you can't clench you can't grind you can't move around you can only open and close into this thing right it doesn't alter the occlusion in any way it's got a labial bow and we've made some modifications to it over the years and it works really really well studies have shown that when what ralph did was very interesting so he took a patient 
and put them into a sleep uh, study and, and monitored all the EMG recordings of the muscles and then put the same patient back in with the appliance and lo and behold, there's virtually no muscle activity. So we know that once the joints are in the right place and you put this appliance in, there will be no muscle activity, mm -hmm. very, very little. This is why yeah. when patients came to me with a box full of appliances, said, so, well, I've got this one I had at night and somebody ate them, it may be another one, I've got a Michigan and this and that. To me, it doesn't make any sense because if we look at it logically, a Michigan splint is made with so-called perfect idealized occlusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if one joint is in and one joint is out, how can that make any sense? Mm -hmm. What's the point of having an ideal occlusion on joints that aren't, you know, where one is breaking down, one isn't? That's the first thing. The second yep. thing is it doesn't stop the mandible moving. And so the muscles are still moving at night. You need to get that under control. Okay. And that's why we use the double appliance. I think with the stabilization, the, the background uh, dentists who, who favor this appliance, they are thinking that they are working within, it's sort of, it's the, the bite records are taken within the centric relation. Yeah. In your armamentarium, do you see it as a acceptable splint for a primary muscular patient to wear at night? Well, it may well be. I've never done it. I've always used the double one because I feel I have much more control mm -hmm. and the patients tolerate it incredibly well. In fact, I say to patients, for me, the night appliance, which is called the Garcia, after Ralph Garcia, is like olive oil is to Jamie Oliver. You cannot, I couldn't run the practice without that, like a cook can't work without olive oil. That's how important it is and patients smile and so on. They accept it. They wear it. They're fine. Okay, very good. But your other appliance may also be very effective. It's just I don't have any experience with that. I, no, I appreciate that. I'm just speaking uh, on behalf of most classically yeah. trained uh, restorative dentists who, who favor the, the stabilization splint. And, and I feel as though in my training, it yeah. was very much like, you know, when you, you learn the soft bite guard, yeah. the bite raising appliance, and then you figure out a lot of patients come back worse. Yeah. Uh, and I've got a history, loads of patients in that, in that way. And then I, I went through a phase of giving everyone a stabilization splint. Yep. And then I realized that, okay, whilst it's helping some people, and the, the, the silliest thing I did was give the stabilization splint as a protective appliance mm -hmm. because the patients were asymptomatic and their compliance was very, very low with that appliance. And therefore, they didn't have that driver within to wear it. And then I went all the other different types of appliances. Now I'm very much, okay, what is their diagnosis? How can I best treat that individual diagnosis with the different splints available. And that may be a mandibular advance and splint, a gelb appliance, which I do now as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's taken me years. And I feel as mm -hmm. though uh, dental school doesn't offer, offer you that. You need to really invest in lots of education. And sometimes I feel, and I worry about this, Patrick, and I need, I need your guidance in this, that sometimes I feel as though what I'm doing is if a, if the patient takes one of my splints, similar to the ones that you, you know, your one that looks like a bionator mm -hmm. and takes it to a restorative consultant mm -hmm. or an orthodontic consultant in a mm -hmm. hospital, mm -hmm. They'll be like, what, what is this? Throw it in the bin. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because they don't know better. And so how do, how do we create an environment where we can all grow to, to, together? That's well, the big well, problem. Well, one of them is, is the EMG study to show how the muscles are relaxed. And that's a fact. And we give out a, hand, a, a sheet, a handout sheet to patients to show them this is evidence-based. This is not my feeling or my opinion or I think this should work or that should work. This is evidence. And I think Brendan used to say something and he used to say, you know, opinions like backsides everybody's got one but we're not interested in opinions i think this i think we're interested in facts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. facts are usually things that you can measure that's why we measure mouth opening mm -hmm. left and right lateral excursions protrusion that's why we measure where the joint is that's why we look at the four seven position of gelb and things like that the more that we get away from this opinion and the more we get into facts i think the, the greater results we will have i just this double appliance, you know, it's so easy. You just mm -hmm. take two alginate impressions, or if you have an intraoral camera, you don't need that. You take a wax bite, you know, in an edge-to-edge -edge position, open three millimeter, and that's it. And it's, it's so show, simple. I've got one to show you later. It's so recently, simple yeah. mm -hmm. that only when you start doing this one after another and you see the results, will you say, oh, let's forget the other one. This does it. This does it all. Mm -hmm. And it's robust. It doesn't break. It's just a great appliance. Okay. Good, good. Right. Oh, can I say something about yeah. MRIs? Yeah, because yeah. I know it's really controversial. So in my practice, because I was a specialist orthodontist and patients had been to see many, many other practitioners, I demanded an MRI on every patient, right? Every patient. No MRI, no treatment. It's as simple as that. Yes, of course, patients said, well, it costs a lot of money. It costs about £550. 
And uh, In inflation you know, has affected that figure. That may, no, but <laughs> you know, if you're going to do a lot of uh, restorative work or uh, a lot of orthodontics, it costs a lot more than that, and uh, it might be money well spent to know before. So by doing that, we uncovered a lot of misdiagnoses, obviously, and this is where. I feel MRI is so important. Now, it may have gone up in price, but, you know, if we can get more and more people doing it, I think it'll bring the price down just like, you know, mobile phone prices came down and tape recorders and all that sort of thing. I remember being a student back in the late 70s in Germany, and they said, oh, you know, these fixed appliances, they take so long to put on and it's so costly. Well, what happened? You know, we started with bands on every tooth when I was doing uh, And then bonding came in. Suddenly you could do everything much quicker. So I think there's going to be progress in that field. But Having said that... Really, you know, they don't know how to go about in referring where the local centre is. So, I know, but I, I can give you a lot of yeah. advice about that. And unfortunately, a lot of centers that are good and there are not many radiologists in this country are good. But So I'm going to interject here again and say I absolutely agree. And it's, it's a shame that I am agreeing with this, that the quality of uh, MRI interpretation or MRI centers in the UK, at least, is very poor in my experience so far. So I'm, I'm so glad that Patrick was able to introduce me to Kevin Lotsoff, who um, not only manages very well the imaging side and, and ensures that they've got the correct kit and the correct settings take good quality MRIs, but the reporting is brilliant. Now, I have seen lots of patients where I've seen their MRI report and their history and clinical examination does not match the diagnosis in the report. The report says that everything's fine or it says like completely the opposite of what I expected. And so at, at first I thought, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a young dentist. Who am I to doubt this uh, radiologist? Then I decided, okay, I, I need to get a second opinion here. So the same MRI I would send to another radiologist such as Kevin Lotsoff and I'd get a completely different diagnosis, which for, to me was like, wait a minute, these are images you know, how can there be any variability? And I learned that actually there is a big difference in, in, in terms of reporting. I also found that different MRI centers will take different quality images, which kind of makes sense. But there's a huge, huge difference in the, the quality of the images. Some images you get back which are completely non-diagnostic and the report that goes with it is completely poor. And, and it's a shame that has been my experience and my patients have had to pay again for a second report to actually get the correct diagnosis when it comes to MRIs. Now, interestingly, MRIs, I've kind of yo-yoed. I used to take MRIs a lot more, now I take them a bit less because I found that with me being so conservative with the nature of the kind of treatments I do, they don't usually change my treatment philosophy. And so I know Patrick's very pro MRI and I have been uh, taking MRIs under his guidance and advice and I'm very thankful for that. But I, I, I want to just play a snippet from another episode that we did with Mr. Andrew Sidebottom uh, and let's hear his take on MRIs. Probably a little controversial in my views on imaging. Um, I very rarely will get an MRI. The reason being that the MRI scanners we have in this country, first of all, the majority are 1.5 Tesla. And so you, the, the views aren't that great. The radiologists are few and far between who are good at interpreting them. And mm. when you look at the best series in the world, you know, from, from the likes of the Ninth People's Hospital, um, Qi Yang's unit in China, even there the accuracy of diagnosing a disc tear is about 50%. And mm -hmm. so if you base your surgical intervention on your MRI, 50% of the time you're going to be wrong. So yes, I echo the part whereby you have to be very careful in terms of who is reporting uh, on the MRI and actually which center you have the MRI done. So for the vast majority of clinicians and patients, access to the right type of MRI and the right type of report is not going to come by very easily. I need to make another point here, which is really important, because there are a lot of wonderful people out there. And I uh, mentioned Annika Iceberg, uh, who's written a wonderful book on TMD. Now, she is in a university where her department, she's a radiologist, her department is next to the orthodontic department, right? And she's done a lot of research over the years with PhD students on condylar growth and the position of the disc. And she's done this on rabbits, and rabbits are very similar to us, and that's all been proven. She has shown a 100% study that when the disc is out of place in a growing child, the growth. mandible will not grow to its full genetic potential. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So she then said to her orthodontist there, listen, don't you think it'd be a good idea if you took an MRI before you put in a functional jaw orthopedic appliance and the patient could wear it 16, 20 hours a day or whatever for how many years, because if everything is not in the right place, it won't work. They still aren't doing that. 
mm-hmm. and she's right next to them. So we were taught if the function of plants doesn't work, it's patient cooperation. He's a poor grower. It's mm-hmm. nonsense that. Mm-hmm. The evidence now is out there that you have to have the disc in the right place to get correct common mm-hmm. growth. Otherwise, you get shortening of the ramus mm-hmm. and, and less uh, bulk of bone uh, of the condyle. So that's now really well uh, established. And of course, then you come on to the whole problem. And I, I've seen it too often, and I'm sure other people have, that you put the functional plants in to correct a class 2 div 1. Everything is fine. And then when you take the plants out, you know, a year and a half later or so when they've been wearing it, oh, right here. now they've got this dual bite or what they call the Sunday bite where you posture forward, right? And that is probably because the disc was out. You were just pushing everything into the right position, but it couldn't stay there because mm-hmm. the rest of the stomatic nervic system wasn't working correctly. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another reason for saying, hmm, if you want to do orthodontic treatment, and it's going to cost quite a lot of money, isn't the seven or eight or 900 pounds of that MRI worth it, given this is research done, which is now evidence-based, and mm-hmm. you can't get away from it. It's not her opinion. This is a fact. Just interjecting to say that I think it's brilliant what's been said here uh, about the influence of the disc in, in nurturing the condyle and actually getting proper growth. Now, listen to this snippet from PDP 080 once again, because it's very relevant. Listen to what Jim McKee has to say about the exact same thing that Patrick has just mentioned. When you ask the patient, they've been clicking for 20 years and they don't have any bite problems. In a case like that, I'm going to monitor it. There, there is a symptomatic click, though, that I would say that we should pay more attention to. And that's in the growing female. If there is a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old girl with an asymptomatic click that doesn't hurt yet, to me, that warrants further investigation. Only because many times pain won't develop till the mid to late teen years. And many times those patients are patients that have displaced discs and aren't growing And if we could reestablish that condyle disc interface with maybe some type of functional orthodontic clients, we may be able to positively influence growth. So if it's an asymptomatic click in a growing patient... That's very useful to know. That's uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, uh, uh, very valid point. Uh, As I grow in this field as well, I've seen the the value of MRIs, especially I get more and more complex patients, intracapsular issues. Uh, It's opened my eyes a lot more. And yeah, the whole incident with getting different reports from different uh, radiologists, that was really fascinating for me as well, actually. I know some people say, well, you know, you've got to stay still in the scanner for a certain period of time and this, that and the other. We've never had a problem with that at all. And the dynamic images are excellent. So I know there's some people out there who don't believe in an MRI, but they must be on the fringe because there's nobody in orthopedic medicine who doesn't believe in an MRI. And TMD is an orthopedic musculoskeletal. There's no getting away from that. But not all centers are equipped. To, to, to actually do that. You need someone with, a, with a special equipment to, to be able to do Yeah, that. you need to have the right head coils yes, and so on and so forth. So we need to get this out there. But I think the more and more people who see that they've got a TM joint problem, they've had the correct MRI, it will eventually spread, perhaps not from the profession, but like Stack said, it'll be driven by patients eventually. It's the patients who come to your door. You know, I used to get a lot of patients, not just from uh, other healthcare professions, but a lot through the internet, which is not the way that we should be working. We should work as a profession amongst ourselves. But the patients are so desperate sometimes that all they do is they sit up at night for three or four hours and they're looking up. And we've had patients from Spain and, and all over because they're desperate. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, I've and seen that's a lot of how, patients last year, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, and I say unfortunately because it's a shame that they've had to yeah. search dental, very specific dental terms to be able to yeah. find this. Exactly. Find exactly. Uh, I think you we touched on this already, which is uh, what your views on orthodontics cannot treat or induce TMD. We, do, we I think we both agreed that if you're saying that orthodontics can't treat or induce it, then what you're saying is that the way the teeth come together has nothing to do with it. But we know that that's got a lot to do with it. So do you, any yes. any comments on, on that? I think I think man, mandibular movement is very important. I think the one the one factor that everybody's agreed on, even the establishment today, is the unilateral cross bite. Mm. So if the patient closes and at last minute it moves across, obviously they're not going up and down uh, and they're, they're having to shift. That has to weaken one side of the masticatory system. So that is a definite. Then obviously the path of closure must have something to do with it. If you have steeply inclined upper and lower anteriors like you do in a class 2 div 2 and a distal path of closure, which you have to have in order to get into centric, you may be a bit more liable to disc displacement. So 
Uh, what, what, and you would have seen this from doing your orthodontics, but I've seen in yeah. my basic orthodontics yeah. compared to you is when you give them more overjet, the mandible just comes forward. Because the mandible has been trapped. And the way I put it across to patients was, imagine you open the garage door. The garage door is the maxilla. You've got to get the maxilla treated and then the mandible, which is the car, can come in and be housed within the maxilla. So maxillary development is absolutely key in in all orthodontic treatment, as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, the foot and the shoe analogy as well. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, we've discussed some of, your, some of your views about orthodontics and TMD and why perhaps we both disagree that what they like to say, orthodontists, and I, and I, and I mean that with respect because a lot of my friends and colleagues are orthodontists and you know, you, you know more orthodontists than I do, is that we mean this with respect, but I think it's unfair to say the blanket statement from that study yeah. saying that, you know, T like Luther, I think it was Luther study. Freddy Luther up in Leeds, I think, yeah. That, yeah. that orthodontics cannot treat or induce TMD. That is... Yeah, you know, I, would, I would clarify that by saying I would never do orthodontic treatment and move teeth to correct an intracapsular problem. Mm. I would use a splint mm -hmm. to to correct the problem because the splint is an orthopedic yep. device which is altering a maxillomandibular mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. The orthodontics is to fix that position. Yep, yep, yep. And that's a, a really important point, well made. Two different types of patients. Let's say you have one patient who is primary muscular. They've got huge, bulging masters. Mm -hmm. They're bruxomaniacs. They don't have much, and we see this in, in patients that, uh, males particularly, that they don't have much of an intracapsular component their downfall, their symptoms are very much uh, apparent. And the, the reason they're destroying their teeth is this um, innate driver of bruxism that they yeah. have. How do you treat that patient right. in terms of your philosophies? Okay, so I, I've now come to the conclusion that all patients have a muscular component, all of them. Yeah. Okay, because I'm going to go so far as saying that in the studies that one very good study done by Ross Talents out at Eastman Dental, Rochester, New York, that the majority of patients who present for treatment, the majority will have disc displacement, okay? So the only, and people talk about, you know, myofascial pain dysfunction syndrome. That to me only exists if there is no intracapsular problem. So that means you would need an MRI to know there is no intracapsular problem before you say you've got MPDS. Let's assume that you have an ID block and it goes through the medial pterygoid and you have perfect joints. That would be a typical myofascial pain dysfunction syndrome. So everybody who has any form of intra-articular problem will have muscle uh, component. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. uh, the thing is that since very few people are taking MRI scans and making a diagnosis of an intracapsular problem to some degree, because we're going by clinical, you know, no, we clinical, can't anything. You use a stethoscope, yeah. maybe use a Doppler. Yeah, I mean that that's as good as you can get. Yeah. But even 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 God can't tell you exactly what's going on in these joints. Imaging is the only way forward now, and everybody in the profession, I think, agrees, except for a few, that the gold standard now is an MRI, mm -hmm. and that's why I said we shouldn't worry about OPG films and, and X-rays. I mean, in the old days, we used to take. Uh, x-rays of the joints as well but that only shows you where the bone is it shows there may be a disc there but it doesn't show you the disc it shows the disc space but it's not good enough mm -hmm. we need to have as good as we can get and some of the scans that we get today are so good that you can see on the scan a discomaleolar ligament it was the ligament that goes from the back end of the disc into the middle ear i mean you can't get better than that mm -hmm. so uh, for people to say there's you know it, it's misleading because i've heard people say you know when we open the joint up it's not the same the surgeons I work with, we look at the MRI before the surgery, and we've done hundreds of surgeries. They're incredibly accurate. The correlation of Dr. Lotsoff's report with what the surgeons I work mm -hmm. with find at surgery is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I think where I'm at now, and the, with, with the mentors that I've had and training I've done, that where I see some, and with respect to some, some not, not disagreement, but just a different way, the a perspective I see the world, is that I do see patients as being just primary muscular yeah. with, with minimal intercapsular and I yeah. do see other patients and I, I, I never see patients who are just intercapsular without muscular they, they, that okay. always for me is together well, but I do see some who once I give them something like a B-splint for example mm -hmm. something that's permissive something that allows their mandible to now move I was just going to say that release yeah. the mandible yeah. Yeah. and then re reduce the, the, the strain yeah. and they, they do wonderful so what I would do in that case is, is fit a flat plane splint yes in other words yeah. it would have uh, 
uh, no indentations, yep. which would lock the bite. It would be like an ice ring. That's so it. I tell the patient, I'll give you a flat plate splint. There is no occlusion on, but my teeth don't meet. I don't want them to meet because that'll tell you where to go. Let it be like an ice ring. It can go anywhere and the muscles will unwind yes. in the same way as rubber bands unwind. So absolutely from a muscle myalgic problem, that's absolutely the thing to do. The worst thing to do is to give them a bite and makes them much worse. Yes, they yeah. need to be okay. free. Right, no, we, we totally agree then. And then how is that different? And this is where, uh, as, as I'm seeing more and more complex patients, this is where I really come to you for mm -hmm. guidance is those primary intracapsular. Yeah. You've mentioned it already about yeah. the daytime spin and the yeah, nighttime yeah, spin right. MRI. Yeah. Let's talk about, because you've mentioned that already, then what happens afterwards? Now, do you do a repeat MRI to make sure that the disc well, isn't, or, or maybe go back a bit? No, I'll go back. When I fit the splint, the mandibular splint, and it's always, always, always mandibular. I've never fitted a maxillary splint, and there are a lot of reasons why mandibular splints are preferable for intracapsular problems. I fit it as a flat plane splint for at least one or two weeks. Why? Because I want the patient to get used to it. They're going to wear it 24 7. They're going to eat with it, and however difficult it is, that's what they're going to do. Then, if it's a problem like a reciprocal click, and I'm going to convert that in the chair, in the surgery, into a pull forward splint. And then we'll go from there and mm -hmm. then we have to decide. There are other patients where the disc can't be recaptured. And so we're going to make the splint slightly different. We're going to fit what's called a pivot splint to start with. And that we're going to do for three months and then we're going to go to surgery. Okay, so mm -hmm. my practice was hugely surgically based for very good reasons. And uh, the results have been fantastic, which we published, as I say, uh, back in 2016. It's actually one of the longest studies in the world done uh, where we followed patients for 15 years. Can we share and read? And, and yeah, read? absolutely. Yeah, that, um, really and, uh, and, and and there's another one going to come out, I think, fairly soon from a colleague and friend of mine, Piero Casconi in Rome, who's head of the maxillofacial unit there. He's been doing uh, functional arthroplasties now, which is similar to dislocation, for 30, even 35 years. Uh, so people don't do treatments that don't work. And these treatments do cost quite a lot of money because they take a long time. Patients would come back banging on your door if it doesn't work. It's as simple as that. So mm -hmm. people say, oh, well, they've gone off somewhere else. No, they don't. They mm -hmm. don't. They'd come back. Now, to answer your question, that's one thing, if I could have my career again, I'd love to do. And uh, with Richard Pollock, we're probably going to do this. And that is to take another MRI after we've done our stage one treatment before we do stage two to make sure that what we set out to do, we've achieved. Nobody in the world has really done that. And the reason being that often after treatment, it takes a while for everything to settle down. Certainly after surgery, and Kevin Lotson says, you, you know, it's very difficult to read the thing. But it's also a matter of cost and, and yeah. insurance yeah. money. Practicality but, is... is but yeah. I, I've been to university hospitals and said, look, why don't we do a double blind study? And I'll come and treat the patients for nothing. Yeah, one day a week, or one day a fortnight, and let's do it. Let's do the study and let's set it up where we can do this to mm -hmm. actually prove it one way or the other. Sadly, this has not happened yet, and I doubt it will. I would love for that to happen. I think it's great. I, I just want to pick on the fact that the way you start your splint therapy for these patients yep. is, is with a flat plane appliance. I Absolutely. think that's genius because Absolutely. a lot of time the lateral pterygoid tension releases, yep. Yep. and you might find that perhaps that for those patients who that was the source of the yep. issue, yep. that the, the disc yep. then now reduces. Definitively, is yep. that is that something something some well, sometimes what you found? Absolutely, and uh, but I also followed up also with the with the pull forward splint that's highly indexed, so they can only open and close in a certain region. And of course, once you've done that for about, they usually wear it for nine months to a year before we do any stage two orthodontics. They can't go back to the original position. Mm -hmm. There is no click and they, they stay there. So that brings me on to something else, which is can you bring a mandible forward without surgery in a non growing individual? And the answer. I think you can, mm -hmm. to a degree. Get the That's, disc in the right position, I get think the condom in the right position. I, can, I think you can do it to something like five millimeters or so. Mm -hmm. The posterior open bites that you have yeah, at the end, yeah, yeah. is that due to just the fact that the condyle is now further forward and then the, the, the disc now occupies some space, yeah. or, and the intrusion of by wearing a heavy appliance that's a, a posterior bite plane basically yeah okay so if you bite together now and bring your jaw forward into you know slightly more 
class one relationship, you're going to have a posterior open bite. That's what I want to have. I want a posterior open bite at the end of my splint treatment. Otherwise, I haven't achieved it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's due to reorganizing the mandibular apparatus. Maximum the mandibular relationship. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you usually they're class two or they usually have very deep bites. And basically... In a deep bite, you probably have a larger yes. posterior space. But what's so beautiful is by using a pull forward splint in a deep bite case, by the time you finish, you now have no overbite, no overjet. All mm -hmm. you've got to do is get the white things to meet. You've, you've corrected all that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is so simple. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how do you... Uh, but the orthodontics is a little bit more complicated, but it's not that complicated about how you maintain that yeah. occlusal, uh, the maxillary mandibular relationship. But no, teeth don't intrude. You know, we made these lower splints without incisal coverage. And people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, the incisors will over erupt and all this business. You know, there's a, a paper by Gordian Brown, which I can give you, it shows from x-rays they've done, there is no over eruption or intrusion of other teeth unless they're really, really heavy clenchers. Yeah, yeah. But then I say to myself, does that really matter anyway? Because I'm going to be doing orthodontics at the end. So if there's a slight problem, I'm going to fix that anyway. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is fix the patient, get them out of pain, get the mandible in the right place, and I'll deal with the orthodontics. That's what orthodontics is. Do you use TADS to... to, to, to... I haven't. I've only used it once. But yeah, I, I think you could use TADS. The beauty, I yet to find somebody who can... In stage two, what you do is you put blocks on the posterior, lower posterior teeth to keep the vertical height right. Sure. And of course, those can get loose and they can wear down. That doesn't matter. And you just got to refresh them every month or so. But if you could find a way of securing the lower terminal molars to a TAD or implant or something, then there'd be no movement of that tooth. Mm -hmm. And of course, then that would cut out one other problem. But, you know, I haven't yet been able to do that. I mean, as a restorative dentist, the, the thing to me is that when you have that much space at the back on the, on the, on the, yep. just on the terminal molars, to put non-preparation onlays on them, yep. to, to actually get them into intercuspation with the opposing. So you essentially restored that space. And then with the rest of the teeth, that's going to secure your joint position and the rest of the teeth you, you then extrude them? Is that what, you, what you've done? Yeah, what you do is you put the block of uh, composite on the lower molars mm -hmm. at the right height. You then put all your lower fixed appliance on. Mm -hmm. At that time, you don't put anything on the uppers most of the time because the upper occlusal plane is usually flat. It's sure. usually there's an increased curve of spay in the lower. Mm -hmm. And then what you're doing is you're pivoting all these teeth off the terminal molars. So you are extruding the teeth, but you're not extruding the teeth as such. It's like the tooth, the gum, and the bone all come up together. Mm -hmm. You don't move mm -hmm. the tooth out of the gum and the bone. No, no, the whole thing comes alveola. up. Dental alveolar. It's a dental alveolar thing, and you can close a posterior open bite of at least up to one centimeter. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. And mm -hmm. I've done it, and I've got the slides to show that. And so that can easily be done if you use the right technique with the right wires, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you're pivoting off the back okay. molars. Very good. No, it's, it's good to have one to, to learn, okay, what, what happens in, in a phase two after you have the disc in the right position yeah. and you ha have a, a posture of my... My advice to people who don't want to do phase two or haven't got an orthodontist is keep the patient on the splint. But the last thing is you don't want to take the patient off the splint because they're going to go back to their pathological position. The problem then they have then, if they're, if they're not intercuspating posteriorly, is that, you know, I've had patients tell me firsthand that their, their ability to chew has to change or decreased. And so that's, you just have a potential disadvantage at, at keeping them weaned yeah. at, at phase one. Well, then, you know, the answer is we need to get out there and teach. The orthodontist can easily do what I'm saying in stage two. Mm -hmm. They really can. I mean, any orthodontist can do it. And any general dentist who's done some fixed appliance work can get into this as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a steep learning curve. Yes, you may have what's called a brown pants moment, but it can be done. And it's the only way. You have to get out of your comfort zone if you want to improve. Because the other slide that I saw once was if you're unwilling to change, you've already reached your maximum potential. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you want to improve your practice and improve what you can offer, you will have to have a few anxious moments, but that's the only way of learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's still worthwhile doing. And, you know, if there's somebody around who can mentor like myself, or other people, uh, hold your hand while you're doing it. I think it would be really good. I think, well, you'd be, uh, if any orthodontists are watching, watching, listening, and they're, they're interested in this, and we'll make yeah. sure you're contactable. To, to get mentorship and guidance because, yep. you know, well, yep. it's important to, to learn from yep. all the years of experience that you have and, and, and to share that. So that, that's really great. Well, we'll put on a course which will show how to do stage one and stage two with the orthodontics with the slides and show how to go step by step through it. And it's actually much, much easier than people think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's predictable. Very good. Now, those are the, the, the main questions I had for TMD before we switch gears, have a little break and switch gears into interceptive orthodontics. There are probably some things that uh, we haven't really covered which I'm, I'm sure you want to just get off, uh, get out of your chest, maybe. 
what, what are some important messages that you want to send out to to general dentists who are watching and listening while you have the microphone about the management of TMD or diagnoses or etiology or, or, or just the, the kind of complexity that we have with that? Well, I think the first thing is to get a decent history. That's the first thing to do. Get a decent history. And any patient that has what I would do to start with is I would make a double appliance at night. And I think you'll see that a lot of your patients will actually improve a lot with the symptoms that they present with. And that's very simple. And the reason I say it's simple is because, as I say, it's two impressions and a wax bite, which the lab will make up. Uh, but it won't make any change to the occlusion because patients can get absolutely paranoid about saying, my, my bite's changed, and then you're really in a problem. This does not happen. Whereas the moment you start wearing a split for a long period of time, more than three months or so, then, of course, there will be changes. And, of course, this whole idea that's that, you more, know... That's more than 24-7 one. Yeah. Yeah. This whole idea that, you know, we must do reversible procedures, which the establishment wants to tell us. You tell me any any dental procedure that is not, they're all irreversible. All the dentics is irreversible and it all relapses 10, 20 years later, a lot of the time. So, so are composite veneers, by the way, for uh, those doing composite so, veneers there as well. But, any, you know, any, everything is irreversible. Yeah. Uh, so th this idea must be, rever I don't know why. The reason I think why, because they're not sure what we're talking about. If, you know, if you can get the disc back in a place and you can do the occlusion right and the orthodontic, that's fine. But because they can't do that, they're worried that now the bite has changed because they've had the splint in and they can't fix now the bite. And that is the missing link that people have not made. So in the old days, when people did TMJ surgery, the results were terrible. The reason was they were doing surgery with no taking into account anything to do with the dentition. No. Now, when you put the dentition together with the joints, now you're covering everything. So now it makes total sense. And mm -hmm. that's why the splint and the surgery and the orthodontics eventually has been much more successful, certainly in the last 15, 20 years that we've been doing it. Just last question, uh, collaboration, did you work with restorative dentists who took over the, perhaps there wasn't enough yeah. of a, yeah. a space to, to warrant orthodontics yeah. and a bit of a collaboration did the trick? Did you yeah. have those cases? Yeah, I think, you know, collaboration is a finishing procedure. It's not a treatment. So if at the end of your orthodontics you need to do a bit of a clusical collaboration, that's fine to get everything as perfect as you can. And then you make your double appliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big believer nowadays in the last few years that a lot of the orthodontics that has done Yes, patients might adapt to what you give them, but a few, little yeah, bit of finishing, yeah, little yeah, tiny yeah, bit yeah. of nail plastic here and there yeah. makes such a difference yeah, yeah. to getting a nice uh, pathway yeah. of the bite and yeah. a nice even bite. Yeah. Right there. I think it's something that's not taught and it's neglected. No, I think you're absolutely right because it's very difficult, even with the modern brackets, which are angulated and have the tip and talk and everything put into them. It's very difficult to get a perfect a perfect occlusion. Uh, you know, you may have a slight bolt discrepancy when lateral size is not quite wide enough. So, or, you know, a lower premolar, and that, of course, upsets the apple cart. So there's absolutely a place for occlusal collaboration as a finishing procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much again to Patrick Grossman for giving his time and expertise and his perspectives. And some of those perspectives I very much agree with. Some of those I agree with in certain conditions. And some of those I think that actually there's an another explanation or I don't fully agree especially the whole thing about all muscular symptoms being secondary to a disc displacement but there's so much good value and great lessons we can learn from someone who's treated TMD uh, for 30 years we, we covered some great anatomy communication physiology and all the controversial debates that we have in the spheres of TMD and occlusion if you're listening or watching on the app this is eligible for a very meaty uh, amount of CPD this episode was produced by Erica Allen Benitez. Your CPD lead is Marie Benitez, and the premium notes were collected and verified by Chriselle Jane Facun. My team worked really hard on this one, so I just want to say personally, well done to the team. It was one of the longest, if not the longest, episode we've had, so it was a trickier one from that nature. I can only imagine how Joe Rogan does his, like, three-hour marathon podcast, right? Now, on the topic of TMD, if you'd like to learn how to manage TMDs as a GDP, so general dentist, what you should treat, what you should refer, what are the red flags you should watch out for, how not to be scared of the anatomy or not to be scared of that TMD emergency appointment, as well as having access to an on-demand online course, having access to a secret community where you can just ask questions and interact in the monthly coaching. So check out Splint Course. That's splintcourse.com, which I set up for GDPs a few years ago now. It's a nice little community of dentists that we have now who either just want to know which appliance that they need to prescribe to prevent the patient destroying their dentistry, or they start venturing into pain and, and finding out which patients are actually low-hanging fruit in GDP land. 
And of course, if you'd like to have a hands-on course to learn more about Dr. Patrick Grossman's philosophy, although he's retired, he still teaches. So he taught me how to do a, a pull-forward splint and a pivot splint, all these kind of things. If you'd like to go on one of his courses, I'll put the contacts and details in the show notes below. And for those of you who are, who are listening on your commute, I appreciate you making it all the way to the end. You deserve a pat on the back for making it this far, especially for such a, a meaty and geeky episode such as this one. Thank you so much again. I'll catch you same time, same place next week. 